Okay, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to the first uh, the HIPEC, uh the seminar uh, in the fourth uh, semester of uh, 2022. So uh, our uh, the speaker today is uh, the Dr. Uh, the Michael Andrews uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. So he worked at uh, the CMS and uh, the received uh, uh, his PhD degree from uh, the Carnegie Mellon University. So today, uh, the, he is going to, uh, to talk about uh, machine learning and its application for exotic uh, SDKs. So please. Okay, thank you. So the title of the talk is Searching for New Physics Using End-to-End -end Physics Reconstruction. So I'll say more about what I mean by this in a bit. So the situation, um, in the search for new physics can be summarized as the following. So we're, we're interested in looking for new physics in the coming years ahead of the LHC. Um, we've not found any so far. And one of the reasons for this, of course, is that uh, beyond the standard model of physics could just be beyond the energy reach of the LHC. But of course, we have this um, expensive detector. We wanna make the most of it. So we wanna try and cover all bases. Um, so there's been growing interest in non-standard model exotic decay signatures, um, typically signatures that can be misreconstructed or overlooked by existing analyses or existing reconstruction techniques. And this may be one reason why we haven't seen new physics yet is because it's there, but it's sort of um, hard to find or buried in, exist in more mundane looking signatures. And typically this involves some form of boosted particle decay or long-lived particle decay, since these are the ones which are harder to detect and which are more likely to have escaped detection so far. Now, in trying to build a program to search for um, exotic physics, particularly boosted and long-lived decays, it's important to ask how well we can reconstruct these particles if they actually were in the detector. Now to zero order, this means we need to improve the triggers, right? So if, if we don't even trigger on these objects, then they never make it to our data and no amount of analysis or you know, fancy machine learning will, will ever find them. So that's sort of the um, basic goal, and there's certainly a lot of work going to improve the triggers and the sensitivity to more exotic decays. So the next level, assuming you can trigger on these objects, is to determine whether you can actually accurately reconstruct their properties. So perhaps these particles are similar enough to existing particles that they pass the trigger, but they're different enough that when we try to use the same reconstruction algorithms, uh, we actually mismeasure their properties. So maybe the mass is off or the PT is, is off or something of this nature. And that's sort of the focus of this talk. So the technique that we developed is sort of targeted at addressing this part of the problem at the reconstruction level. So we're assuming that we can um, fairly efficiently trigger on these objects and the task is now to determine um, how accurately we can reconstruct their properties. And so if you wanna know more about the content here, I will refer you to two CMS papers. Uh, the first paper focuses mostly on the technique, the, this end-to-end -end physics reconstruction technique. And the second paper focuses more on the application to a physics analysis. Um, and so actually the second paper just came out on the archive today. Um, so as a use case to illustrate some of these reconstruction challenges, we will use this um, signal topology, which is the uh, an exotic, de of the exotic decay of the Higgs to two light particles, these AA, and then each of these AAs goes to two photons each. So while I use this as a use case, you'll, you'll find that many of the challenges you have found in this analysis are common among many boosted and in fact, other exotic searches. So they're fairly general, um, general uh, conclusions we can draw. And so the, the Higgs sector, as, as you might be aware, is, is well motivated because it's less explored and less constrained by 
previous standard model measurements. So this is like one of the few places where it's uh, it's fairly exciting to still look for new physics. Now, as mentioned, this A is often identified as some light spin zero particle, um, and it fits the bill for a number of models that have been proposed in different theories. I list a few here, um, most notably axion light particle production. All right, so this is a fairly popular search program uh, at CMS and the LHC in general, where you look for an A going to a pair of standard model particles. So there's a bunch of these at CMS. Um, and there's also a bunch of these in astrophysics and cosmology and even other collider experiments like GLUEX. Um, and this is because if you identify this A as some axion-like particle, uh, this has potentially important consequences for understanding the early universe and stellar formation. Now, for the specific decay mode of A to 2 photon, so H to AA and A to 2 photon, this is less... Yep. Sorry? Yeah, is there a question? Sorry, was there a question? Everybody, no. You could okay, know. sorry. Um, so this, this particular eight to two photon decay mode is less explored at the LHC. So there is one preliminary result released by Atlas even before the Higgs was discovered. Um, and so there are some limits, but this is not a direct search. And this is before the Higgs was even discovered. Um, with a much smaller data set. So since then, there's not been a real, I guess, dedicated search to look into this. So this is actually the first since then. Um, and there's different regimes that will be of interest here, depending on how light the A is. Um, I'll get to that in a bit. But uh, theoretically, the A to die photon decay mode becomes the branching fraction to this decay mode becomes more attractive the lower the mass of the A. So the A, in most of these models, the A couples um, similar to the way the Higgs does. And so uh, the heavier the particle is, the higher the branching fraction uh, in general. And so it's only interesting once you've closed out the heavier decay mode. So I list a few notable ones here. And so you're really looking at below one GV where this is theoretically attractive. Right now, what's the problem with this one GV below one GV regime? Is it's very experimentally challenging at the LHC. So the smaller your mass, the larger your Lorentz boost for the same energy. So if this is coming from a Higgs boson, if you have a pair of A's coming from the Higgs boson, their energy is approximately half the Higgs mass. Right, so if you have uh, a mass of one GV, you're looking at a boost of about 60. And so what happens at this kind of boost is that the A to two photon system is very collimated or very merged in the detector and will be recon misreconstructed as a single photon object, uh, which I will call here capital gamma. Uh, so it's not to confuse people from, um, a true single photon, which we'll call small gamma. And as you close out these heavier decay modes of the A, you can also prolong the lifetime of the A. And so for these masses, it's actually favored to be long-lived. And so this is a fairly recurring theme, low mass, high boost, longer lifetime. You'll find this in many um, boosted exotic searches. And so you can see what this, the whole topology here would look like. So you have H2AA, each A goes to two photons. Each of the pair of photons is one merged reconstructed photon. And so this whole event signature looks just like a Higgs to gamma gamma, uh, if you look at it in the detector. So if, if these events exist, they would have already been counted as Higgs to gamma gamma events. Uh, so that's why I say we can trigger on these objects, but we can't necessarily reconstruct them as separate events from Higgs to gamma gamma. Uh, and so that's notable because the way they searched for the Higgs to gamma gamma is by looking at the diphoton resonance, right? So you actually looked for that Higgs peak. Um, 
And this Higgs to A8 to 4 photon actually has a degenerate mass peak with the Higgs to gamma gamma. So if you look at the, um, so these are simulated events, of course. Uh, if you look at different masses for 100 MeV, which is the gray, for 400 MeV and for 1 GeV, you have this peak at about 125 GeV. As you go to higher masses, uh, the opening angle between the two uh, di photon starts to open up and you start to misreconstruct the PT, and so you underestimate the, the mass. And so this is actually the effect that the Atlas Run 1 paper exploited. So they basically look for deviations in this Gaussian shape um, in the Higgs peak. So they didn't find anything, as, as you might guess. Um, but they basically exploited this um, mismeasurement phenomenon. And so to really do a direct probe of this signal, you need a way to break this degeneracy, ideally by directly looking at the merged photon, merged diphoton mass spectrum. So basically measuring the mass of these capital gamma objects. Um, and that's what we, what we will try to do. Now, so to get an appreciation for how difficult this is, we can talk a bit about the CMS uh, detector, at least just the electromagnetic calorimeter, which is what measures these photons. And so for CMS, these are made of scintillating crystals. Uh, so we will focus only on the barrel section of the detector. And so each of these crystals has a front face cross section of about two centimeters by two centimeters. So this corresponds to a granular angular granularity of about 0.02 by 0.02. And so another thing to remember is that the Molière radius um, of the eCalc crystals is also about one crystal width. So what that means in practice is that 90% of the energy of a single electron will be laterally uh, spread across a three by three grid of crystals. So I'll show you some pictures in a bit. Um, and so this is sort of the grid that you're, this is the lens you're looking at um, these photons through, right? So you can, all, you're only as good as your detector. If, if they're too collimated, then they'll, they'll land in the same crystal. And so that's exactly what we start to see. So if we look at generated distributions of, of simulated H to A8 to photon, if you plot the opening angles of the two A's, these are sort of what you get for different masses of the A. So on the far left is if you have uh, a 1 GV A mass. And so the boost of this is about 60. Okay, and so the Y axis here is number of crystals along the eta direction. And the X axis is number of crystals in the phi direction. And so what you can see is here on the lower from this, uh, just to the right of the origin, you can see it's about 0.17. So that means 17% of the A decays are separated by one to two crystals in phi and less than one crystal um, in eta, right? And so at that boost, uh, that's the kind of separation you get. Um, so this is what we call ensemble merging. If the two photons land in different crystals, uh, by at least one crystal, then in principle, you can resolve them. Um, and so that's what we call barely resolved or ensemble merging. Now, if you crank up the boost a bit more, which is what you get if you have like a 0.4 GV A mass, uh, then they start to land in the same crystal. So about 66% of the time, the two photons from the A uh, will land within a crystal of each other. Okay, and then, so that's what we call shower merging. You'll see why in a bit. Um, and the last case is what we call instrumental merging, where you have boosts around 600 um, and, and practically all the time they land in, within one crystal, crystal of each other. And so here there's just no way to resolve the two photons in any traditional sense. Um, but as you'll see, we, we will be able to make uh, advances nonetheless. Um, and just for context, a typical boosted CMS analysis, uh, for example, the boosted top quark analysis, um, the boosts there are of order one. Okay, so if you 
have a 100, 200 GV uh, top mass approximately. Typically the PT is about 500 GV. Um, and so you're looking at order one boosts. And so the boosts here are uh, substantially larger by one to two orders of magnitude. So this is beyond anything that CMS has ever looked at, okay? Um, and so these are what they actually look like in the detector. So once you factor in the mold year radius and the fact that you should have some lateral shower width, uh, these are what a typical deposit would look like. So on the left, you see this ensemble merging. You can make out these distinct energy maxima. You can tell that the showers are overlapping, um, but you can make them out at least. And so we have techniques that can reconstruct the mass in this instance. Um, but that's the limit of what they can do. So the next is the shower merging. You see the showers are now overlapping, but the maxima are just, just barely separated. Uh, so this is why we call this shower merging. Now in the far right plot, this is the instrumental merging where the, both the maxima land in the same crystal. Uh, and so there's currently no way, historically there's no way to, to treat this. How do you reconstruct the mass when you don't have a handle on the two objects, right? Um, so in fact, there's a, there's a way to do this, um, which is by looking at the spread in the shower. Um, and that's sort of the effect that we're going to exploit. Even if they land in the same crystal, right? The principal axis connecting those two photons will have slightly uh, wider smearing uh, than the perpendicular axis to that. Um, but it's a very small effect and you won't see it just by looking at pictures of it. So you, you need a machine to do this for you. Um, and that's exactly what we do. So what we mean by end-to-end -end physics reconstruction is to first acknowledge that the fundamental representation of the collision data is detector-like. So they look like images. So they're not particles. The particle interpretation is derived from the data, from the detector data. And while this has served um, the community for, for a long time, uh, particularly for exotic decays, the, they were not designed to handle these sorts of signatures. And so many times these particle reconstruction algorithms that go from raw data to particle data are suboptimal for exotic decays. And so I'll say that CMS is of course aware of this problem and there are programs to improve this. Um, and many of them follow the strategy of, of going sort of end to end. Um, and the catch here is this, once you lose that information in your reconstruction algorithm, there's no way to recover it anymore because machine learning is a method uh, only for extracting information, not for creating it. If you've lost that information along the chain, then there's nothing you can do to recover it unless you go back to the original source of the information. Uh, and that's exactly what we want to do with this end-to-end -end physics reconstruction. So rather than using traditional, uh, mostly cut-based reconstruction algorithms, what we want to do is run machine learning directly on the original data source. Uh, so that's illustrated here. So we have this detector data and we will train uh, a machine learning algorithm directly on those detector deposits. And from that, try to directly estimate or in the parlance of machine learning to regress the mass of the A. Okay, and so we will apply as minimal data processing as possible. And later I'll show you just how sensitive it is to the amount of processing you do. Um, and so in practical terms, what we use is a convolutional neural network trained on these images of these ECAL energy deposits on simulated A to two photon decays. And so this sort of idea has been very popular among neutrino experiments where most of the production reconstruction algorithms are now based on similar ideas. Um, so CMS is of course a, a much more complicated detector so it takes more time to do this. Um, but sort of the seeds have been planted. Um, and one thing is, even this was not enough to regress masses of the A uh, to where we wanted them. So even if we use this, um, this nice idea of doing end-to-end -end machine learning, 
we actually run into detector resolution effects. And so you'll see that on this left plot here. So the y-axis is the prediction or the estimate of the neural network, and the x-axis is the true mass. Now, it may look reasonable to you. Uh, you see this mostly linear diagonal structure. But if you look closely at the upper and lower boundaries, uh, you'll notice uh, it tends to curve. And so especially at the lower mass, at the lower left corner, essentially below true mass of about 0.2 GV, you're always estimating the same value. So you introduce this nonlinear bias where everything below one below 0.2 GV gets mapped to essentially 0.2 GV. So now this is a problem because this regime is actually the most theoretically attractive, right? So that's where we've closed out all of the heavier decay modes. So if this uh, decay mode exists, it's, it's probably going to be here. And so the fact that we can't probe that is sort of like a big deal breaker um, in terms of you know the, the market value of, of this analysis. And not only that, there's another particle that lives here, which is the pi zero at 135 MeV, and we can't use that to validate the regressor, right? So there's a lot that's at stake at this lower uh, mass regime. And so we would like as much as possible to recover it at all costs. And so this was the main, I guess, innovation of this analysis is to develop this technique called domain continuation. And it's, it's very much inspired by what you do in complex analysis. Um, we have this analytic continuation to the complex plane. So there's no complex numbers here. But what we do is we actually fill the training set with photons. And we, in the training set, we label them with negative masses, right? And this actually does the same trick of extending the domain of the function uh, to a non-physical regime, but it fixes everything in the physical regime. And so this is not as crazy as it sounds because we do something very similar when we do parametric fits or likelihood fits. So if we're trying to fit something very near a boundary, um, like if you want to fit a mass, like so I know uh, the Katrin measurement of the neutrino mass, they actually in the fit allow the mass to be negative, even though this would be non-physical. And that's just so that the likelihood function is well behaved at the boundary. Um, so this is exactly what we do here. Um, and so you see the result of this on the right plot. So once we do this domain continuation, you have this really nice, uh, very linear response in the mass regressor all the way down to zero. And so we're in fact able to regress even below, let's say the naive idea of what the detector mass resolution is. And so what you, the cost of this is you have this like gradual uh, flaring out of the, of the mass spectrum. So you don't get these nice Gaussian anymore. Uh, but you don't necessarily expect to um, at this point. Um, and so we validated this. So now that we've also freed up this lower mass regime, we can actually, as I mentioned before, use pi zeros to validate whether this thing is working or not. And so that's what we did. So we looked at you know real, uh, real events. So we looked at uh, QCD jets. So sometimes the QCD jet will contain um, a pi zero. Uh, pi zero to two photons. And so you can use that as a test of your um, mass regressor to see whether it can reconstruct that. And typically at the QCD energies we were able to trigger on, uh, you're looking at a boost of about 200 in the pi zero. Um, and so to benchmark the performance of this um, machine learning algorithm and to, you know, to illustrate to people that this is something that can only be done using uh, this technique is we also used another neural network, uh, which we call this photon neural network. And this is trained on sort of engineered features like uh, shower shape variables and isolation variables. And in fact, these are the same variables that were used in the discovery of the Higgs to die photon um, resonance. And so you can see that is a the blue curve here, uh, where you don't really uh, you get this erratic response with these spurious bumps here and there. And the last one is this eCal clustering algorithm, um, which I hinted at earlier is able to reconstruct 
um, photons if they're at least two to three crystals apart. Uh, so this is actually what we use to calibrate the eCal. Uh, but this is only good for boosts of up to around 50. And so that's the gray curve here in this plot. And you can see it's, it's nowhere near being able to reconstruct the pi zero. So it is able to reconstruct the eta meson, which is about 500 MeV. And you'll notice that we don't with the end to end. And this has to do with um, the fact that these are not isolated particles. They're actually embedded in jets. Um, so there's a lot more going on than I than I make you than I make it out. So there's there's no at this energy there's no such thing as an isolated pi zero or eta meson, um, and so we can talk more about this if you'd like in the backup. Um, but this will actually be a good thing because the pi zero is actually a background for us, right? So we're looking for an eight to two photon, like an isolated eight to two photon. The fact that the pi zero appears in a jet. Um, will actually be a very strong handle on suppressing that background. Um, so now we can, so that's sort of the machine learning side of things and how we validated that specific technique. And so now we want to use that technique to build a physics analysis. And so that's this H to A, A to four photon analysis, right? Um, and so we want to perform a direct measurement of the mass spectrum of such events. And what we use is the, the 2D mass actually. So we have two A's, we, well, um, hypothetically we have two A's. Each of those A's has its own um, diphoton. And so we can actually regress the mass of one versus the other. Um, so that's what we do here in these plots. So the y-axis is the subleading energy, and the x-axis is the leading energy uh, reconstructed photon. And so each axis here corresponds to one eight to di photon decay. And so you can see what the spectrum looks like uh, for different simulated signal events. So for the left, you can see uh, 0.1 GV, middle is 0.4 GV, and on the right is one GV. Um, and so you can see, even though at 0.1 GV, it's not great, it's still um, usable, right? Um, and so this is what we will use to break the um, Higgs mass degeneracy with the Higgs to gamma gamma events. So we won't look at the, um, let's say the Higgs mass, but we'll look at the um, A versus A mass. And so this is the main signal discriminant we use in the analysis. Um, and what we use to build the, uh, the background model and whatnot. So I'll jump ahead to the results, the unblinded results. And so on the left plot here is basically the observed spectrum you get. So we define some signal region um, where we expect the signal would live and we perform a measurement of what that spectrum looks like. Then we fit it against templates of uh, the signal templates you saw earlier. And so here on the left, you'll see it's mostly just this smoothly falling uh, distribution downwards. And that's because most of the backgrounds we have are actually photons that have converted to E plus E minus before reaching the ECAL. Uh, and so those will have some um, mass by way of the interact. So these typically form as they uh, through nuclear interactions with the detector material. And so they acquire some mass and the process. And so that's the smoothly falling distribution that you see. And you'll see that there's, there, isn't, there isn't actually any strong pi zero peak. Uh, you don't see any um, peaks sticking out here. So you can see this a bit more clearly on the right where we look at the 1D projection. So basically you project it down to the X axis. These are the distributions you get. Um, so the data versus, so the data are the black points the background we have is the solid blue line. And for, for context, we show what the signal masses would look like. So the normalization here is at the expected limit uh, times 1,000. So what we the limits that we exclude are about 1,000 times smaller than these signal shapes you see here. Does that make sense so far? OK. So I have a question the, here. Yeah, sure. 
Uh, on the left pro, what's seventy five percent mean? Fifty percent, and on the right yes. pro, how the signal is normalized. Right, so on the left plot, 75% here means 75% of the peak height. Uh, so basically this plot here in the middle, if you draw a contour where the peak is at 50% and 75% of, of its maximum, those are the two contours you see on the left. Okay, so the normalization of the signal on the right. Um, so the spoiler is that we didn't find anything. Um, but we do set expected limits. Um, and so the expected limits um, are how these plots are how these signal distributions are normalized. So the expected limit at each mass point, we take that um, cross section and we multiply it by a factor of a thousand just so you can see it. Uh, and that's this plot here. So another way to see this is if you reduce these signal plots by a factor of a thousand, uh, that's basically the excluded uh, cross section. Does that make sense? Okay, so basically the upper limit times one hundred multiplied one hundred one thousand is this distribution here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if we didn't multiply it by a thousand, then it was very difficult to see. So this is mostly just for, for, for context. Um, and so we can talk a bit about why it's important to suppress the pi zeros and why it's actually good that we don't reconstruct them. So there's another analysis like this, which was done by the GLUEX experiment. Um, they don't produce Higgs bosons. So this is more like nuclear physics stuff. Um, so, but they are looking for A to two photon production, right? And so you can see on the left, the spectrum that they measure. And you can see there are these two resonances which stick out, which are the pi zero and the eta meson. And because they have very efficiently reconstructed these resonances, they're actually um, dominated um, by these backgrounds and they can't measure the presence of an A um, around these resonances. So if you look at the right plot, which is their limit plot, um, the glue X limit is the red um, region. And so you can see they don't have anything above the pi zero mass, which is the far left X axis. And around the eta meson mass, they're completely empty. And so that's sort of a unique position uh, the LHC is in. Uh, because we don't produce isolated pi zeros at high energy. They're always collimated with other hadrons in the jets. And so we can use the fact that they're not very well isolated to cut down on this background. And as you saw in the previous spots, we do this quite well. Um, so the ob observed limits, okay, as mentioned, we didn't find anything, but we do set the most uh, stringent limits for this process in, in this decay mode at least um, to date. And so if, if you recall, I said earlier that if this um, Higgs to AA to four photon uh, were realized, it would have been counted as a Higgs to gamma gamma event. Um, and that's because of this de degeneracy effect in the mass. Um, and so we can actually use the measurement of the Higgs to gamma gamma branching fraction as an indirect constraint on the cross section of the production cross section for this process, the signal process, right? And so that's this red band here on the left. So if we had used the Higgs to gamma gamma analysis, that's sort of the limit that we would set um, in the limit of, of low A mass. So we, we chop it at 0.1, because if you ran the same selection, um, as you have higher A mass, you open up the two photons and the efficiency to select those actually goes down. So the limit um, gets worse or the red curve starts to go higher. Um, we didn't do the work to calculate those numbers, so we didn't plot it here, um, but it does go up to the right. So you can see that across the board, we do set limits which are more competitive um, than the indirect limits set by the branching Higgs to gamma gamma branching fraction measurement. Um, so we do actually, not only 
have we done this analysis for the first time? We've, we've set quite competitive limits um, on this. And in fact, the first limits below the dynuon threshold, so below 0.2 GV, uh, because we because the technique is something that has allowed um, access to this regime for the first time. Um, so I can talk about some lessons learned, you know, outlook of, of what else you could do with this technique. And so you might ask, like, how important is it that you use raw data for this? And we actually did a few studies to see if it was enough to use a process form of the detector data rather than the lowest level form of it. Um, in fact, it's logistically difficult to get the most raw data. And so a big headache in this analysis was the, the data logistics. And so you can see the impact of training on processed detector data versus the quote unquote raw detector data. So on the left is if you train with raw data, on the right is if you process if you train with processed data. And so for each of these plots, there's two curves. One is if you use that model on the raw data versus the um, processed or clustered data. And so on the left, what you see is that the, the, the peak is, un is mostly unchanged. So what that means is that if you train on raw data, you are robust against changes in processing. So whether you use raw data or you use processed data, um, the position of your peak does not change. Now that is not the case if you use process, if you train on processed data, which is the one you see on the right. So if you train on processed data and you ran on the raw data, you actually see this shift in the peak. The peak goes down and it shifts. And that's because the raw data tends to have more of these noisy spurious um, deposits Right, and so if you've never trained on noisy data, you don't know how to deal with noisy data. And so that is actually the advantage of training on raw data is you learn how to suppress noise, right? You build in this robustness because you showed it what noisy data looks like. It learns to mitigate noise. And so this is useful um, if you have changing pileup conditions, if you have changing um, detector response, and I can show you, and this is part of the validation that we did, is how does this technique respond to the changing noise of the eCal or the fact that the crystals lose their transparency over time or that you have different pileup regimes. And so what we showed is by using the noisiest form of the data, we actually train this machine learning to deal and manage with these detector effects. And so we actually got very good um, robustness out of this model, which you wouldn't have gotten if you trained on a more processed form of the data. So it is critical to use low level data for this to all work. Um, and so when we did this analysis, we assumed that the A was decaying promptly, that it was not long lived. But as I mentioned earlier, this is not the most realistic assumption you can actually, at this mass, it's, it's actually more likely to be long-lived. And so we tried to assess how the response of, the, of this mass regression um, model would change if you had a long-lived A. And so you'll see that on the left plot. So for different particle lifetimes, um, you see that you have this gradual degradation of the mass peak. It's not so much that the peak shifts, but you just have this gradual, um, uh, let's say, losing of, of resolution. And so these are not, these lifetimes I show here, uh, these are for individual A objects. So this is different from how you parameterize lifetimes for signal models. So usually for signal models, you have this lifetime parameter uh, but that's not the lifetime of any one particle. The lifetime of any one particle is, is usually some exponential distribution around that parameter. Uh, but in this case, this is we can actually control the lifetime of, of each particle that we simulate. And so this is for uh, for fixed lifetime. Um, how does the response look like? And so in the paper, we actually include uh, limits for 
different signal um, lifetime parameters. Um, and so they, they do get worse if you have longer lifetimes for the most part, uh, but there's actually situations where you have better limits, uh, particularly at uh, 400 MeV, if your A mass is 400 MeV. Now, the reason for that is because when you have a long-lived A, uh, it, the, if, it, if the decay vertex is displaced, um, the effect of that is you will have a smaller opening angle at the detector um, face, right? So if you just, so this, the angle subtended by that opening angle, um, if the surface is closer, uh, will tend to be smaller. And so it will actually look more merged. Um, and so this can be a good thing if your merging is not too, too much, because um, the, event selection is actually, in our case, optimized for selecting photons. So the larger the opening angle, the more we lose selection efficiency on the A's. So there's this sweet spot where if the merging is not too much and they're long lived, um, you actually get better selection efficiency on them. And so you get um, better limits. And so another thing you could do is rather than measuring the mass of long-lived particles, you could measure the lifetime directly of these particles, right? So there's nothing stopping you from training um, a similar end-to-end -end algorithm to predict the mass, uh, so to, to predict the lifetime of the particle rather than the mass. And that's sort of what we did here on the right. Uh, you can see it's not great. Uh, the lifetime resolution is essentially very poor. And that's because the ECAL is not really designed to do this. But you can imagine there's a timing detector that's going to be installed um, in the next upgrade of the, LA, uh, the CMS detector. And so you can imagine adding that information um, to get a stronger handle on this timing information. And in general, you can add more sub detectors to this. Like if you wanted to look at jets rather than photons, you would need the track and the um, HCAL, for instance, and you could certainly add more sub detectors. And so as an example of, of something we were looking at, there's actually this detector called the pre-shower, um, which has never been used and tends to be more of a nuisance than anything. Uh, but it's actually a very uh, fine grained uh, detector which sits just in front of the ECAL end caps. Um, and in fact, it has a, somewhat of a 10 to 15 fold uh, more granular cells than the ECAL end caps. And so you can see if you had fired an, an A to two photon into the end cap, even though it would look merged in the ECAL, which is this gray clusters here you see in this image, it's possible that. Um, with the pre-shower, you would be able to resolve these two photons, right? And so that's what you can see here. You can sort of see these two crosshairs and the colored, and those represent the deposits from the pre-shower. And so you can see that you can make out those two photons, even though they're fully merged in the ECAL. And so this is another idea that could be explored, um, adding additional sub-detectors to squeeze out every last bit you can get from the detector. Um, and so I, I know that um, many in this group are interested in, have worked on this um, analysis and are perhaps interested in um, performing an analysis. Um, and what I can say is that, you know, what we have is, is directly applicable to this um, decay out of the box. Uh, so the training we did doesn't care where the A came from. It doesn't matter if it's a Higgs or if it's a some new heavy resonance. All that matters is the kinematics of the A itself, right? So in fact, we trained this mass regressor on just particle guns of A's. There was no Higgs bosons in there. Uh, so it's, it's equally applicable for this analysis as it was for ours. Um, and the threshold you put on what you can resolve um, was this delta R of 0.04. And my estimate is this is about a boost of 50, right? And so with the technique we have, you can probe boost um, an order of magnitude more. Um, so you'd probably be able to probe the, the one GV if you had this. So basically um, 
one order of magnitude to the left of this vertical line you've drawn. Um, so that's that's what I have. Um, so I, you know, we didn't, obviously we didn't find anything, but I think the the broader significance of this work is the technique itself, right? So many people have looked into this uh, to mix success. Um, as I mentioned, there's a program to sort of overhaul the existing reconstruction algorithms uh, with this end-to-end -end treatment. Um, but how we've used this here is to not to see how you can improve existing algorithms, but how you can build completely new capabilities, right? If you had this sort of power, what could you do today that you couldn't do before? And that's really what this analysis was about. So we've, we've shown it for this Higgs to AA to four photon, but many of the challenges here are applicable to many exotic decays. Um, and the prospect here is you're really opening new doors to, to analyses that I've never done before or that you did not think were possible before. Um, and, I, and that's sort of what we hope will be um, the usefulness of this tool. Uh, so that's it. If there are any questions, I can try and address them. Yes, thank you, Michael. Uh, I have about two or three questions. No problem. And starting the Park the uh, page before last one, but uh, pretty shallow. And I uh, true, I never mm -hmm. seen any analysis in pretty shallow. Uh, yeah. Do you know the the this simply we don't use that is a bit of with, with the proper calibration? Do you know? Yeah. So. It's an open question whether you can effectively use the pre-shower in an analysis. Um, typically, the way the pre-shower gets used is as a correction on the energy measurement of the end cap. So they measure the total energy deposited in the pre-shower and they use that to correct what was measured in the eCal. But as far as using the full granularity of the pre-shower, and using it as a, as an honest to goodness handle on detecting physics that's not been done yet. So there's people trying to do this. Um, probably images are not the best way. You could probably use graph neural networks and you know, both people in our group and other groups have started to look into this. Um, but here, this, is, this was simulated with no pilot, right? So that becomes the problem because the challenge with the pre-shower is when you have pile up, um, you have a lot of these nuclear interactions in the tracker that just splatter all over the pre-shower. And that's the main challenge to getting the pre-shower to work is you have a very high level of, of noise due to the secondary um, showers from, from the tracker material due to pile up. Um, and so it is an open question whether you can pull this off, but I'm, optim I'm mildly optimistic that you can do this. Um, if you do it with deep learning, you can potentially learn how to mitigate noise, as you saw in some of the earlier slides. Okay. The second question is uh, training with the PARP. The PARP are different from 16, 17, 18. How did you handle? Yeah, so that's an um, interesting question. We actually only trained with one pileup scenario. Um, so we only trained on simulated 2017 detector data. And we, we relied on the fact, uh, we relied on the ability of the algorithm to extrapolate to different ranges of pileup within that distribution. Um, to learn how to extrapolate to 2016 and 2018, since this was the full run to analysis. And so this is in fact, one of the things we checked. If you, so we can look again at the phi zero in data and see how the peak changes from 2017 to 2018, for example. Um, and that's what you see on the right plot here. So if you, the same model trained only in 2017 data, how does it look on 2017 versus 18 data? And you can see it's extremely um, good agreement. I see. 
And you can also ask because the transparency of the ECAL crystals changes over the year. Um, as you get more radiation, you lose transparency in the crystals. Uh, so you can ask. And so that will tend to change the, the, the noise levels in the detector. Yes. Right. So if you have more transparency loss, um, that tends to increase the RMS on the reconstructed amplitude. Um, and so you can ask, how does it change versus um, noise level? And that's what this plot on the left shows for three different periods where you have about 10% difference in, sorry, 25% difference in noise. Um, how does that peak change? And you can see the position of the peak is itself also very uh, spot on. Um, and we did the same with, with PILA, uh, which is here on the right. And the Y axis is the predict is the regressed mass and the X axis is the pile up range. Um, and you can see here, it's, it's very flat versus pile up. Mm. Um, and so I go back to the credit of all this is the fact that we have trained on raw data. So I always say the raw data with codes because it's not technically correct, but it's, it's mostly correct. Uh, it's still calibrated. Um, in that sense, it's not raw data, but it's, it's very minimally processed. And so this all goes back to the fact that we've trained on minimally processed data. And so our model, our algorithm has learned to deal with noise and other detector effects. And so you don't get this if you train on processed data. And I think this is the, this is the, one of the missing pieces um, in why some attempts at this did not succeed. Because most people, the easiest collection to access is the minimally processed data. So most of the data you get out of the, uh, the servers out of CMS are the processed ones. So most people don't even know this raw data exists. Um, and so this is part of the studies we did. Um, you really have to go back to, you know, you need to dig up this um, raw data, so to speak. And that's really where these models shine. All right, so the reason we actually realized this by accident because what was happening um, so this is sort of how they different they look. So the right is the process data. The left is the quote unquote raw data. So you have a lot more of these like spurious energy deposits. But what can also happen is you can lose the second photon. So this one on the left is actually an A to two photon where this lower left cluster is actually the second photon. Um, and sometimes if it's if it's too low in energy, your reconstruction algorithm will actually drop it because it thinks it's a pileup deposit or something like that. And so now you're only left with one deposit. Um, so we, we noticed this thing that, okay, above a certain mass, like they all look like photons already. Um, and so that's where we found that you sort of had to go back um, and look at the less processed version. I see. One last question uh, for the training, what kind of data you use? The AOD or mini AOD? Or so it was the AOD. AOD. The AOD right. So we used, um, I don't know if I have it here. We used simulated particle guns. Yeah. So the training set was eight to two photon. So basically these were pi zeros where we changed the mass. Um, so these are simulated with 2017 conditions, and these are AOD um, ECAL records. And then, as mentioned, we also had to include photons, which we labeled with negative masses. So this should all be described in the paper. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay, any other questions? Okay, it's uh, not. I have a okay. I yeah. have a one question. So, you, the beginning you mentioned about uh, <clears throat> the some physics motivation like uh, ALP. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. So I I expect also you can make uh, some ALP through the plot, but I couldn't find uh, all the CMS result yet. So, can you explain? 
uh, why your analysis result not contain some, something like the physics model interpretation? Right, so we try to avoid uh, being too model specific. Um, and this, the A mass regime is also in the non-perturbative um, regime. So there's actually no predictions you can get for the A to two photon branching fraction at this mass because this is all sort of non-perturbative. Um, but yeah, in principle, at least for the, you could make some assumptions, I suppose, but I guess we opted not to. Um, not to commit to any one model interpretation and just, so the limits are expressed just in branching fraction mm. of, of H2 uh, full signal process. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any other questions? <clears throat> okay, if not, uh, then let me uh, stop recording here.